Hi, um, this lecture will be on food fats and your health. This is part one with the emphasis on fatty acids. We'll start out by going over a little bit of basic chemistry. I promise to keep it minimal, just things that I guarantee you're going to hear again, and it's good to know the names of them. So just some basic alkanes. These are hydrocarbon chemicals with no uh, double bonds. First one is methane, like in, you know, in fart smell. So that's CH4, carbon and four hydrogens. Carbon forms four bonds, so you see a H coming off each direction. And then when the carbon is free to bond with something else, that becomes a methyl group. And what's especially relevant for our talk is when the carbon is bound to two other things, like two other carbons, it is called, the carbon with its two hydrogens is called a methylene group. And that's especially important and relevant for when we talk about polyunsaturated fatty acids like omega-3s and omega-6s. Methylene group is going to come up with regard to lipid peroxidation. Okay, the next thing is ethane, two carbons. And when you put an alcohol group on it, that becomes ethyl alcohol, standard drinking alcohol. Propane is three carbons. Butane is four carbons, all connected to each other. Pentane is five carbons connected to each other. Okay, now we're going to talk about some basic alcohol groups. So whenever you see OH, that is called an alcohol group or a hydroxyl group. Um, so when the single carbon, previously methane, when it was all hydrogens around it, now becomes methanol. That's like wood alcohol, you don't want to drink that, it'll cause brain damage. Ethanol, we spoke about that, regular drinking alcohol. Propanol, we can put a high single hydroxyl group on there, we'll call it, and if we put three of them on there, propane with three hydroxyl groups or three alcohol groups, same thing, hydroxyl group, alcohol group for our purposes. Then you're talking about propane, carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three. So this would be propane one, two, three, triol. And actually I like these chemical names because they tell you exactly what the molecule is. The other name for this chemical here is glycerol, which is the backbone of triglycerides. So glycerol, you just know it. A lot of these chemicals got common names long before it was figured out their exact structure. Uh, but propane 1, 2, 3 triol is the backbone of triglycerides. That's going to come up all the time in uh, metabolism and human biochemistry. Okay, we had to go through that background stuff to give you the lingo and make sense of everything once we start talking about fatty acids. So fatty acids are carboxylic acid, which just means there's a carbon attached to an oxygen by a double bond called like a ketone. And then there is a hydroxyl group adjacent to it. So that is a carboxylic acid. You can recognize the names because they end in IC, ick. So ethyl, ethane became ethanoic acid. It also has a common name acetic acid like vinegar. So that's a very common chemical. And the big thing about it is this two carbon unit is the standard building block of fatty acids in the human body. Almost all your fatty acids in the human body are built off these two carbon units and so they'll be called as acetyl groups. And that's why most fatty acids are going to have an even number of carbons. And acetyl-CoA, if you had to pick one molecule that's in the center of all human metabolism, it would be acetyl-CoA, an acetic group of two carbons, and then it's going to be attached to a holding molecule that prevents it from being active. Um, so that's, that's an important thing, you know, acetic acid, two carbon unit. All right, next is propanoic acid. And again, there's a common name, propionic acid. And you'll hear that with propionate in the intestinal tract. And these, by the way, are the three most common short-chain fatty acids that one hears about. And then number four, the, number four butanoic acid, a four-carbon uh, carboxylic acid, also called butyric acid. That one is super important. And we'll just briefly go over these. What happens is the good gut bacteria... Um, that you get from you know eating plants, plant-related bacteria that feed on fiber, will convert some of that fiber into these short-chain fatty acids. The first two, acetic acid and propionic acid, will primarily go to the liver. So they'll go when you eat food, it comes through your intestinal tract, and then there's a portal vein that connects your intestinal tract to the liver, and they will go to the liver, and the liver can make even number carbon fatty acids out of ethanoic acid and odd number carbon. Uh, fatty acids out of the propionic acid, but the butyrate 
And by the way, when you hear eight, A-T-E, that just means the carboxylic acid is deprotonated. A hydrogen has come off of it. Um, so the butyrate is used. It's the main energy source for the colon lining cells. We'll actually have a picture of it. Let me go to the picture of it. Okay, so the good gut bacteria which come from eating plants, there's basically two types of, of gut bacteria. There's one that comes from eating meat and from eating processed food with a lack of fiber. And that's not symbiotic with us. We didn't evolve with that. Our natural diet is a lot of fiber, like a plant-based diet. And so those bacteria are symbiotic. They want to keep us alive to keep their good apartments, so to speak, living in our colon. And they will do things to help us. They will convert the some of the fiber into short-chain fatty acids, the one we just talked about, the two-carbon acetate, three-carbon propionate, and the four-carbon uh, butyrate. And again, when I ended in eight instead of ick, that just means that hydroxyl group has become deprotonated, which is you know, a common thing. Okay, the gut is called the enteric tract, so the lining cells are called enterocytes. Site means cell. In the colon, the lining cells are called colonocytes. And the colonocytes, they get about 70% of their energy from the butyric acid. So it's tremendously important, and it does lots of really good things. It's almost like the hero of the intestinal tract. It prevents leaky gut. It helps the colonocytes maintain tight junctions, and thereby it prevents, helps prevent all those autoimmune diseases. Um, prevents things like Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. That's why it's so important to eat fiber. Dennis Burke felt we should be eating about 100 to 150 grams of fiber per day, but the average American is only eating about 12 to 15 grams of fiber per day. It's a good idea to get at least in a minimum, get about 50 if you can. If you're eating a plant-based diet, it becomes natural to get it. Uh, what else does it do? It, it helps maintain an acidic pH in the colon, which again favors good gut bacteria. In addition, it helps prevent the bile salts Bile salts are these cholesterol-like molecules released by the liver to help digest fats. And they sit around in the colon. And if you have an acidic pH, that's a good thing. You'll defecate them out before they cause any problem. If you don't have an acidic colon pH, they'll get converted to secondary bile salts, which increase the risk of cancer. Butyrate also does other things to help reduce the risk of colon cancer. It also helps uh, promote increased mucin formation, mucus that puts a coating over the colonocytes and helps to protect them. So it does a lot of good things. And I call this secret fat. What I mean by secret fat is that nobody thinks of fiber as being dietary fat, but that's actually what happens. Some of the dietary fiber gets converted into fat. And it's a wonderful thing because fat that comes, let's say, with meat or processed food, it'll typically have a risk of causing leaky gut versus this fiber prevents leaky gut. And it also helps explain why people can live off of just potatoes, even though potatoes have only around 1% fat. And I think the reason is because they're getting a little bit of extra fat from the fiber. Um, and it's interesting. I was just reading a book by uh, Nathan Pritikin. I think I got it right here. It's an incredible book. Uh, what's it called? Uh, the Pritikin Program for Diet and Exercise. Nathan Pritikin summarizes all the scientific and research studies related to diet, and he's so brilliant. His summaries are just like perfect. And uh, one of the things I, that I liked in here is he makes a comment about fat. He basically says, fat deficient. Here it is. So this is Pritikin Program for Diet and Exercise. We're right on page 367. You can still buy this book. I'm still able to find copies of it. It says, in nature, fat deficient diets do not exist. That's an important point. Fat deficient diets do not exist. And then he, he quotes the reference numbers. He also goes through studies where by they took persons and they put them on an incredibly low fat diet. Um, he had patients on a ballpark, I think even less than 1%. Yes, uh, when it's, he put patients on a diet with less than 1% fat, 0.7% fat, and he kept them on it for six months and uh, they did well. They had no adverse effects, and they showed improvements in their blood pressure and cholesterol. So the point I'm saying is we really don't need much dietary fat. Um, and then we get a tiny little extra, the so-called secret fat here from the fiber. In addition, it's been shown we really don't need much protein. Um, that's been talked about before, and there's nice lectures on it by Dr. McDougall and others that basically, you know, human breast milk is only about 5-6%. And that's when we're growing at our fastest as a baby. So we don't even need that much. And they've done big studies. How do you feed poor people and keep them healthy as cheap as possible? And we only need in the ballpark a two and a half, three percent 
uh, protein is what I got from my reading of it. So what I'm saying is we really can do pretty well on very low amounts of protein and very low amounts of fat. And that helps make sense why, you know, um, Walter Kempner had such great results with a 95-5 diet, you know, 90% carbohydrate, 5% fat, 5% protein. The standard vegan diet, low-fat vegan diet, is usually about 80-10-10, 80% carbohydrate, 10% protein, 10% fat. And that's about what the Esselstyn diet is and about what the McDougal diet is, for example. The standard American diet, Western diet, you know, is in the ballpark, like 40 to 50% fat. And way too fat makes people fat and sick. Okay. Uh, this is just a little bit of applied knowledge. If you look at the fact that a child gets most of its gut bacteria initially from the mother and children get their mitochondrial DNA from the mother, the question arises, shouldn't the mother then, you know, be responsible for two-thirds of the kid's expenses? She's got, you know, more than 50% of the kid's DNA. Okay. All right, now we're going to talk about long-chain saturated fatty acids. We intentionally left out medium-chain fatty acids because nobody cares about them. They, they're, they're relatively insignificant for our purposes. The short-chain fatty acids are important because they're made in the gut from the good bacteria. The long-chain fatty acids are important because they're the main dietary source of fatty acids. Most dietary fat is in the form of triglycerides, and then the fatty acids are separated off of the triglyceride. You know, the triglyceride is just fatty acids connected to the glycerol backbone, which we showed earlier. And the most common fatty acid in the human body and in meat and whatnot is palmitic acid. So the notation is C16 colon zero. So the 16 means there's 16 carbons. The zero means there's zero double bonds. This is the most common type of saturated fat. This is the most common fat made by the liver. Um, and so here's an example of a, of a fatty acid drawn out. I leave out the hydrogens because you always know there's a hydrogen there. You know the carbon has to bind to four things and it just gets too cumbersome to put all the hydrogens in. So here we've counted up the number of uh, carbons. We got 16 total consistent with palmitic acid. There's no double bond, so we got the zero right there. And let's make some observations about a fatty acid. First of all, the carboxylic acid side is polar. And the reason it's polar is because the electronegativity of oxygen at 3.5 is much higher than the electronegativity of a hydrogen at 2.1. So there's going to be those oxygens really want electrons. That's why oxygen is the ultimate electron electron acceptor, for example, an electron transport in the mitochondria. Um, it's one of the most electronic, electron hungry uh, elements that there is, versus now in the long hydrocarbon tail of hydrogens and carbons, it's nonpolar because the electronegativity of carbon is about the same as that of hydrogen. So electronegativity of carbon is about 2.5, of hydrogen about 2.1. So those are nonpolar bonds. And what does this mean? It means that the nonpolar segment is soluble in oil, but not in water, not in aqueous. Aqueous means like water. The human body is primarily, uh, its, main, its solvent is basically water, aqueous solvent. So the hydrophilic component, hydro water, philic loving um, component is the carboxylic acid. The hydrophobic, water hating, is the nonpolar hydrocarbon tail. Um, and that's going to be important because this molecule in combination has a polar and a nonpolar segment is what we call amphiphilic. Amphiphilic or amphipathic is often used, means that it's like an amphibian, can live on land and water. Substances which are amphi amphipathic, they have special properties. They can function like an emulsifier, which means to function like a soap or a detergent. They can pull things from the oil like an oily fat in digestion or like the oil, the, the fat in membranes and pull them into aqueous solution. They can disrupt them. And that's why, um, that's a big part of why saturated is fat is thought to uh, be contributing to causing leaky gut. And that's why the body tries to always be binding something to these fats because it doesn't want them functioning like detergents. That's gonna come up a lot. So that's an important concept to be aware of.
Okay, now we're going to talk about unsaturated fats. So the difference between a saturated fat and an unsaturated is a saturated fat, like here, every carbon is just stacked with um, hydrogens. There's a hydrogen everywhere that there's a free spot. And then the next thing is a MUFA. A MUFA means monounsaturated fatty acid. Actually, I forgot to draw the double bond in there. There should be a double bond, like where I'm moving the mouse. I hope the mouse is in the right spot. There, there should be a double bond in there. A MUFA is like the classic MUFA is olive oil, oleic acid. Okay, So it has one double bond, and that means it's intermediate between sat fat and a PUFA. A PUFA drawn over here is polyunsaturated fatty acid. Okay. And here's a classic polyunsaturated fatty acid, an omega-6, like linoleic acid. And there's two ways to count the carbons. You can count from the carboxyl end. That's called the delta end. And that's sort of a standard nomenclature in organic chemistry. Um, so this would be carbon number one, the carboxylic carbon. And then you count your way back. But the problem is when you metabolize fats, you're going to be working with this carboxylic end because it's much more reactive for elongating fats, for shortening fats. So we don't want to mess with that because it'll screw up our counting and, and the fatty acid will keep changing its name. It'll confuse everyone. So what we count by in biochemistry and nutritional chemistry is by the methyl end of the fatty acid. And that's also called the omega end. So counting from this side, this is the first one over here by our word PUFA is carbon number one, carbon number two, carbon number three. If the, do, if the double bond is at the carbon number three position, that would be an omega-3 fat. If the double bond, as we have drawn here, is at the 6th position, beginning at number 6 carbon, omega-6 carbon, N can also be used to indicate the omega carbon in some nomenclatures, but W is the standard omega uh, letter. Okay, so we'll have a double bond there at 6, so this is an omega-6 fat. Then there's always a, a carbon in between that's not double bonded, and that's our methylene bridge. Remember how we spoke about methylene bridge being important right at the beginning? Well, here it is. That is the methylene bridge carbon, and it's right in between the two double bonds. And the significance of that carbon is that the double bonds have a pull on the electrons, and what that does is it makes the carbons bond to this hydrogen very weak. And sometimes it's also called bis allylic uh, carb, uh, hydrogen, but the real significance for our purpose is that that hydrogen will pop off, especially in the presence of oxygen. So this is why PUFA molecules are so fragile because oxygens will want to pull off that hydrogen. It can sometimes start a chain reaction called lipid peroxidation, and it'll damage the PUFA, and it can then create a series of chain reactions like a domino effect into the plasma membranes, including the mitochondrial membrane, and be very damaging. Uh, to prevent PUFAs, like let's say omega-3 fish oil, from going rancid, it's in an opaque container that you're supposed to keep in the fridge because at the colder temperature, reactions are less likely to happen. The opacity to prevent sunlight from initiating a reaction, for example. And here is, again, the nomenclature. So this is linoleic acid, so C18, because there's 18 carbons, 2, because there's two double bonds, the omega sign, 6, and then I added the 9, showing you where the double bonds are at it. Positions number 6 from the omega end and position number 9 from the omega end. And then we showed carbon number 8 is the methylene bridge carbon. So that uh, vulnerability to uh, peroxidation is one of the major problems with PUFAs. Um, PUFAs, you know, the body does need them, but the best way to get them is to get them from eating plants. And we're going to go over some of the reasons why. Okay, now we're going to talk about um, the family of fatty acids that have 18 carbons. So the C18 family of fatty acids. So if you have the saturated fat, C18, zero double bonds, that's called steric acid. If you've got C18 with one double bond at the 9 position, that's called oleic acid, and that's olive oil. That's the main component of olive oil. Olive plants is called oleo. So if you've got two double bonds, beginning from the omega N carbon number six and omega six fat, that's called linoleic acid and it's abbreviated LA. Linoleic acid and the next one, alpha linoleic acid, linolenic acid are the two essential fatty acids. And the way I remember them is there's two letters in LA for linoleic acid, L for linoleic and then A for acid. So those two letters remind me that it's, there's two double bonds. Then the 
omega-3 fat, alpha linoleic, lenic acid. I remember that there's three double bonds because there's three letters. ALL has three letters and there's three double bonds. The more double bonds you have, the more vulnerable that fatty acid is to lipid peroxidation. Um, and these are the essential fatty acids. They're also sometimes called the parent essential fatty acids. Your omega-6 fats, the derivatives of this, like arachidonic acid, are made from this linoleic acid. The derivatives of omega-3 fats, like EFA and, uh, and EPA and DHA, are made from this omega-3 fat. So it's just good to know that because these not, you'll, you'll hear these names a lot, LA and ALA. So once you've seen them, now it'll make more sense. Okay, we're going to talk about should people take omega-3 supplements, okay? Um, anytime you're eating fat, you increase the likelihood of you yourself becoming fat. Fat calories are very concentrated. There's about 4,000 calories per pound of fat, and there's nothing else there. They're highly processed. Everything else has been removed. All the other micronutrients are removed, all the fiber, everything else. It's just fat. And the more fat you eat, the higher the percentage of fat in your diet, the more likely you will be obese. And there's people who've been trying to lose weight, but they continue to eat oil, and a lot of them have trouble losing weight because of that. So eating fat on a daily basis, taking capsules full of fat, is going to increase your risk of being fat and being un unable to lose weight if you want to. In addition, they're not proven to provide a benefit. Um, in research studies, they weren't shown to be able to improve cardiac outcomes in a significant way or to prevent dementia. Um, they increase insulin resistance, meaning that they increase the tendency for insulin not to work effectively and allow blood sugar to be increased. I mean, fat in general causes insulin resistance. It's not that big of a surprise. But when you have a medication, you always want the benefits to outweigh the negatives. And I don't see any proven benefits for omega-3 supplements, but I do see negatives. A lot of the uh, positive studies you'll see on any like famous product like caffeine or uh, omega-3s there's always going to be a lot of industry sponsored research that makes these items look better than they really are um, so another concern of course we talked about lipid peroxidation that's why the opaque bottle and you have to put it in the fridge in addition theoretically we evolved perhaps from gorillas or chimps and they don't eat fish, so why should we need to eat fish if that's really the case? Theoretically, we evolved in equatorial Africa where there's hot water. There's not any cold water fish, and so those fish don't have any inclination to have omega-3s, which is used like antifreeze in fish that live in very cold waters that are near freezing. So the point I'm saying is if we did evolve in equatorial Africa and our ancestors lived there, they didn't not, we don't know if they ate fish or not, probably not, but even still, the fish they ate wouldn't have much um, omega-3s given they were living in a hot water area. That would actually make their plasma membranes more vulnerable to oxidation in uh, relatively warm waters. Um, it's been shown based on the research of Dr. Walter Kempner, Nathan Pritikin, uh, David Blankenhorn, Caldwell Esselstyn, Peter Quo, Meyer Friedman, that the best diet has only about 5 or 10% total fat, and that's total fat. Low-fat diets, um, they just do better. They have less risk of atherosclerosis, cancer, and they live longer and healthier, and they're skinnier, less diabetes, less hypertension. Excuse me. Omega-3 uh, fats have been associated with increased risk of prostate cancer. The best reference is Brasky et al., uh, from the SELECT study in, done in 2013. Um, there's some question about possible immune suppression. There's suggestions, especially in mice research, that that might be significant in mice at least. How significant it is in humans, I don't know. Um, I briefly mentioned that Winnitz in 1917, American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, he had those patients you know, for six months only eating 0.7% uh, fat, and they did just fine. Um, that research was confirmed by another researcher, McKean, in 1970 in Lancet, um, that people can live with incredibly low amounts of fat. And like I said, people have been put in metabolic wards and only eaten potatoes for months, and they come out of there feeling good. And that's only 1% or less of fat. 
And like I said too, I think a little bit of fat's kind of getting present from the uh, fiber, but still incredibly low amounts of fat and people doing well. Okay, here's another question that often arises. Should people eat olive oil? So we talked about this, primarily of the MUFA, you know, monounsaturated fatty acid, oleic acid, C18 with one double bond. So here's the problem, just like we spoke about, if you're eating any oil, oil means liquid fat, and it also means a highly processed substance with the micronutrients removed, the fiber removed, et cetera. Um, so it's likely to cause weight gain. Every day you're putting a little extra fat in your mouth, you're gonna probably gain weight. Um, it's associated with obesity. Anything that makes you fat increases your risk of diabetes. Um, it increases your risk slightly of hypertension when you get fat. Um, all fats increase the risk of atherosclerosis, and that's based on the research of Nathan Pritikin, Caldwell Esselstyn, Meyer Friedman, and Blankenhorn. So, you know, Blankenhorn did cardiac cast on these patients, and it didn't matter what type of fat they were eating, they were just getting um, worse atherosclerosis. Uh, Pritikin, after doing an extensive study of the literature, basically said fat is bad. You want to minimize your fat intake. And that's been my impression from extensive reading on the subject, as well as many others. Um, Robert Vogel, he's a famous cardiologist who does this brachial artery reactivity test to indicate whether or not something is damaging endothelial function. And he studied the Mediterranean diet and its different components. And what he found was that olive oil did, postprandially means just after eating, impair endothelial function. The artery subsequent to that was less able to vasodilate. Um, there's also, they called it, a decrease in flow-mediated vasodilation. He basically came to the conclusion that there's some beneficial things about the Mediterranean diet, like the fruits and vegetables in it perhaps, but it's not, the benefit's not coming from the uh, olive oil in terms of arterial function. Olive oil also contains more than just oleic acid, C18, one double bond, the MUFA. It also contains saturated fat in the ballpark of about 13%. Um, some of the studies that suggest a benefit for olive oil are industry funded, where they'll compare it to some really lousy diet such that they're trying to make the olive oil look good. In general, when you look at research study, whenever somebody studies one item, like one type of food, that usually means industry's paying for it, trying to make their food look good. Because most you know, groups of researchers or institutions doing research, they don't study one food at a time, typically. Um, another paper by Rudell in 1995, I think it's arterial thrombosis vascular, I forget, ATVB, the journal, but they studied African green monkeys because they're thought to have some physiology similar to humans, and there was no benefit of the monkeys eating MUFAs, monounsaturated fatty acids like olive oil, instead of saturated fat. Olive oil also does increase your postprandial triglycerides and in the blood, and that is a risk factor for atherosclerosis. Olive oil increases clotting factor number seven, also called proconvertin, and so it's thought to increase the, well, that's actually a little bit complicated, but I think that's going to cause a little bit of an increase in the tendency of the blood to clot. Author's name for that paper was Larson et al., 1997, same, same journal. Okay, olive oil is detrimental to the endothelium. This is another study in addition to that one we spoke about earlier by Vogel. This is by Silva et al., 2007, in the Journal of Nutrition, Metabolism, and Cardiovascular Disease. So the bottom line is I don't recommend olive oil. I don't think it's good for you. And... And you hear some people saying it's good for you, but I think they're comparing it to like the standard American diet. And if you combine it with fruits and vegetables and starches and then compare it to the standard American diet, it's gonna make it seem like olive oil is doing good, but it's really the other foods that are doing good. It's not the olive oil. Okay, then, is saturated fat okay to eat? Because you hear a lot of paleo, low-carb crowds saying, oh, saturated fat is fine, it's f there's nothing wrong with eating saturated fat. Actually, again, you want to keep it to the minimal. If you just eat a low-fat plant-based diet, you'll get all the fat you need. It's impossible to be deficient in the fat you need if you're eating a variety of plant foods. Um, is saturated fat okay? So trans fat is really... It's an artificially produced, typically. Yeah, you can get a tiny bit from animals, but it's primarily artificially produced of hydro hydrogenated oils, and it's really like a especially bad form of saturated fat. It stiffens the, the fatty acid tail of hydrocarbons, 
saturated fat mostly comes from meat. It's the most common fat from meat. Trans fat is especially present in processed food. Um, and you really don't want to eat any trans fat. You want to try to get your trans fat in, uh, intake as close to zero as you can. Uh, for dietary fat, whenever a person starts eating more than 15% fat, they're increasing the likelihood of becoming obese. Uh, the more fat you eat, the more likely you are to become fat yourself. Saturated fat increases LDL cholesterol. LDL cholesterol is a bridging molecule. I got pictures of its bridging molecule or, or drawings um, in the lecture on atherosclerosis if you're interested in that. It'll cause Rouleau formation, stack of coins is what it means in French, of the red blood cells and the blood being thick that'll increase your blood pressure. Increased atherosclerosis will increase the risk of myocardial infarction and cerebrovascular accident. That just means stroke. It'll cause tissue hypoxia, decreased oxygen supply to the tissues. When you have decreased oxygen supply to the tissues, remember the metabolic theory of cancer, especially from the work out of Arbarg, you won the Nobel Prize in about 1930, that when tissue is hypoxic, some cells will die. They'll go into apoptosis. But some cells will de-differentiate. That means become primitive, become like an anaerobic bacteria, no longer function as a member of a team within an organ, like within the liver or another organ system, the kidney, for example. And so the point is tissue hypoxia increases the risk of cancer. Um, so it's the cell shifting from aerobic metabolism with oxygen to anaerobic metabolism without oxygen. Um, and that's the metabolic theory of cancer. And that's been pretty well, this is pretty well known stuff, Otto Warburg's uh, metabolic theory of cancer. The tissue hypoxia is also associated with decreased oxygen getting to the brain. And we talked about it in the prevention of dementia lecture that, you know, chronic cerebral hypoperfusion or hypoxia predisposes to neurons dying, going into apoptosis, which means programmed cell death. So there's no big stroke acute finding on a brain MRI. There's just a constantly, progressively, gradually shrinking brain, which is the most common thing one sees with dementia. Okay, number seven, saturated fat is able to get into skeletal muscle faster than does glucose. There's different ways that saturated fat is thought to get into the muscle so fast. One is that it can flip-flop. So you got, you got a lipid bilator and there's two parts, okay? So the cap of the marker is like the polar head. The fatty acid can sort of like intercalate itself into the outer layer. This would be the outer uh, part of the plasma membrane and the phospholipid bilayer. This would be the inner part. And then once it's in, it'll be like the marker here, I'll show it like this. It'll be like, it'll be like the marker, and it'll get in, and then it, it initially it's protonated, but then it becomes deprotonated. Well, it's deprotonated to get in, and then it becomes protonated, so it loses its charge, and that enables it to, to move through the fossil of the bilayer, oops, and it'll flip-flop to the other side. So that's called the flip-flop mechanism of fatty acid entry, okay? In addition, there's something called CD36 receptors that are thought to transport uh, fatty acids across the plasma cell membrane. And there's different theories about how it all works, but the bottom line, what matters is the fatty acid get into the skeletal muscle faster than does the glucose after eating a meal. And because of that, the mitochondria starts to metabolize the fatty acids, and in particular, the saturated fat. It just seems to send too many electron carriers to the electron transport chain in the inner mitochondrial membrane too fast. I have a bunch of stuff about this in my diabetes lecture because this is relevant to diabetes. And it sort of overwhelms the electron transport capacity of the inner mitochondrial membrane. And it pumps too many protons into the intermembranous space. And that leads to um, a backup in electron transport. Because the gradient's so high, it can, they can no longer pump protons into it. And now electron transport starts to run backwards. When electron transport starts to run backwards, then Krebs cycle runs backwards and glycolysis runs backwards. Basically, all the metabolism inside the cell is like a traffic jam and it's starting to go backwards. The great paper written on this, I think it's the best paper ever written on diabetes, is by Michael Brownlee. And it's called like Unifying Theory of Diabetes Complications. It was selected as the, the best research done in diabetes and he gave what is called the Banting Lecture in 2004. So that's pretty easy to find on the internet. The entire article is available for free. And it's rather extraordinary. He maps out all the details of the biochemistry of diabetes. But the key thing to know is fat is what initiates it. And that's been confirmed by the research of Gerald Shellman, MD, PhD. And he's been at Yale. And they had nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. They could see inside the cell. And the first thing that they can find that's associated with insulin resistance is the accumulation of fat inside the skeletal muscle cell postprandial. Because normally postprandial, after eating, 80-85% of your glucose is supposed to go into the skeletal muscle cells. And um, 
the glucose can't get in when there's insulin resistance because fat's accumulated in the skeletal muscle cell and now the glucose is stuck in the blood and it ends up going to other locations causing problems. But the point I'm making is saturated fat is very damaging to the human body in multiple ways, which to me is a pretty good indicator that we're not made to eat it. If it was good for us, we would have a way to process it. We're made to process starch. Um, that's how our metabolic system works. And when excess of fat is, is given to us and from a dietary sense, we get sick. Um, saturated fat also activates what's called um, the CD36 receptor. And when present in excessive amounts, like especially palmitic acid, the C16 saturated fat, that is thought to increase the risk of metastatic cancer. Um, so this palmitic acid activation of CD36 receptor on cancer cells is thought to be an important mechanism of increasing the chance that cancer will become metastatic. So that's another reason why one would want to reduce the amount of fat in their diet and thus reduce the amount of fat in their blood. Next question, number nine, is cholesterol really associated with atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction, you know, coronary artery disease? And yeah, it is. There's tons of research to support that. The reason why I'm even bringing this up is because, you know, paleo, low carb types will try to say, oh, cholesterol doesn't really matter. And what I'm talking about here is mostly in a middle-aged person. In a middle-aged person, cholesterol really is a big deal. And we know that because when the cholesterol goes high, like let's say in the, to the mid 200s, the incidence of myocardial infarction keeps going up. The higher the cholesterol above, let's say 160, the higher the incidence of myocardial infarction in coronary events. When a person lowers their cholesterol, as in the Esselstyn data, the Ornish data, et cetera, the lower their risk of coronary artery events. If you take a herbivore like humans and you feed them a lot of saturated fat, you feed them eggs, they will develop atherosclerosis. And that comes from the William C. Roberts papers especially his quantitative extent of coronary artery disease at necroscopy. Um, what else? Mr. Fit study, 35, 355,000 men, and there was a linear graded continuous response showing a direct correlation between the amount of cholesterol elevation in the blood and the risk of coronary events. The seven-country study of Ansel Keys, you know, basically showed in Japan where people ate very little meat and had low uh, dietary fat, very rare uh, coronary artery events versus in countries like Finland, in the United States, where people eat a lot of uh, fat, there was much, much, much more common coronary events. And then likewise, you go to populations with very low cholesterol. that are primarily plant-based populations like the Tatahumata in northern Mexico, the Bantu in Africa, the populations in New Guinea. They've got low cholesterol and very low risk of myocardial infarction. So there's a real strong correlation there. That's pretty solid. It's just that cholesterol is in everything in atherosclerosis. There's other things that will cause atherosclerosis and myocardial infarction, but cholesterol is certainly the most common controllable risk factor. Okay, so now the question arises, well, what about the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio? I think it really doesn't matter. I think if a person is eating a lot of plant-based foods, they're going to get enough omega-6s and omega-3s, and they can just forget about it. Eat the healthy diet and don't worry about it. They don't need to supplement. Humans have been on this planet for a long time in wide areas, and we really don't need much. The amount we need is much lower than was previously thought, so I think they'll be just fine with that. Um, some people have said, well, you want to lower your omega-6 intake because then you will lower your amount of arachidonic acid and you'll thus lower the amount of inflammation in your body. My thought is just reduce all your dietary fat by eating the healthy plant foods, which are very low in fat, and you just take care of it and you can forget about the whole issue. Uh, what about leaky gut? We spoke about that briefly. Basically, meat and saturated fat, uh, the saturated fat, and like an emulsifier in processed food, they can cause... Uh, leaky gut, and then leaky gut predisposes to generalized inflammation, predisposes to autoimmune disease. So that was really the key point of this talk, just to go over a little bit of the chemical structures of common fats, and then to address the question, you know, should one take omega-3s? I recommend, uh, I don't see a reason for taking them. Should a person eat olive oil? My recommendation would be to avoid it. Um, should a person worry about omega-6, omega-3? My advice is eat a low-fat 100% plant-based diet and you don't have to really think about it. So I find all these things reassuring and they all are consistent with each other. Again, sort of a rule of thumbs, you know, live like Adam and Eve as if they had indoor plumbing and indoor heating and don't do stuff that they wouldn't do. And um, there's no, there was no processed oils back in those days. So I guess that's it. Hope it was helpful.